I just want to start this video off real quick and tell you that we have new merch available on the website, hvacrvideos.com. There'll be a little card popping up right now. If you guys are interested, we have the new flag t-shirt design. We have the big picture diagnoses t-shirt design. We have the new zip up hoodies. We've got the original HVACR hats and we have the beanies available now. So if you're interested, definitely go check out the website. I really appreciate it. Okay. We're going to go ahead and get on with the video. This video is brought to you by Sporlin quality, integrity, and tradition. We did an installation of some customer supplied walk-in cooler equipment. So uh, they had us install a new RDI systems evaporator and condensing unit and we ran a new line set. Uh, what I'm gonna do today, we did this yesterday and we got the system operational, but today we're gonna do the official startup. So I typically do this, as long as the equipment's working and it's coming down to temperature, we let it run through the night and then we'll come back a day or two later and just do an official startup. So when I walked in today, uh, the temperature controller right there, they're using a, a rebranded key to therm temp plus defrost controller. Now this one says Arctic Fox. Again, it's just rebranded for, for Coal Pack or RDI, same company, um, but it's, it's the same controller. So when I walked in, it said 37 degrees. Now I want you to notice something. Um, well, I don't know if the camera's gonna pick it up or not, but these new high efficiency, it's like a federal mandate, these walk-in, evaporators and condensing units have special energy standards that they have to meet. So this one has a two speed evaporator fan motor. So the temperature controller is currently not calling for cooling. So the evaporator fan motor slow down to like half speed. And then uh, as soon as it calls for cooling, it'll speed up and start moving some air. Um, now I had nothing to do with the design of this equipment. Uh, all that we did was supply the customer's um, representative uh, the box dimensions, the voltage, and then they spec'd out the equipment size as far as BTUs and all that stuff. Now there is new strict guidelines that you're supposed to meet. You know, this has happened on the residential side for years and the commercial side, and now it's hitting the refrigeration side that they're, they have energy standards that they require that you meet to save energy and all that, you know, eco green stuff, which whatever, no opinion on that. Um, so we're gonna do a startup on this. So what we want to see is is just I just monitor the natural operation So I'm gonna back up and I open the walk-in cooler door and we're gonna let this uh, Evaporator turn on and when it turns on I'm, I'm assuming you guys will be able to hear the difference Maybe not see the difference with the frame rate of the camera, but when the evaporator fan motor speed up All right, so the evaporator fan motor sped back up because we're calling for cooling now now on the key to therm temp plus defrost controller, or in this case, the Arctic Fox, there's an LED light in the bottom left-hand corner. This LED light indicates that it's calling for cooling right now. So we're gonna go ahead and check out the set points. Uh, we did edit this a little bit. Okay, that is our actual box set point. That's air temperature in the return air stream, 35 degrees, okay. So we're gonna go ahead and back out. We're gonna look at the differential. We have a three degree differential. We change that. Uh, compressor starts per hour. We set that to zero. That is a delay. Uh, it protects the compressor. We don't use that typically. Defrost per day. Um, I set it to six. That's a little bit aggressive, but this customer's in and out of this box a lot. Uh, defrost duration is 15 minutes. And everything else is alarm features. We don't have any of that set up, so we're not worried about that. Yeah, so that's it on that guy. This guy's good. Now this is factory installed. We literally just hung the evaporator. Um, if you look up here, the way that we hang the evaporator, I think I've talked about this before, is we do tech screws temporarily, and then we drill into the thing. So we get it up there, we find our measurements, we center it, level it, you know, do everything we need to do, hold it temporarily with tech screws, and then we drill the holes and then mount it with quarter inch, uh, you know, bolts and nuts and all that good stuff. So everything's looking good there. If we come back here, um, line sets going up. We have some, some tape up there temporarily because we foamed the holes that we did. We had to redo the holes. Now this one required, because of the BTUs, required a 5 8 3 8 line set. Um, I'm not, I like this new Armaflex, let me turn on the flash, I like this new Armaflex because it protects itself from getting ripped, 
but it doesn't do good for pushing over P-traps. Not my favorite on that, but I mean, it works, it's functional, okay? Looks like we probably could have done a little bit of a better job securing this right here, but I mean, it's not the end of the world. This is the sensing bulb. Um, okay, so that's good. We're looking good there, I don't see any problems. We sealed up all of our holes back in there. You can see there was some electrical holes and different things. So the tape just holds the spray foam that we pushed in from the top back. All right, so we're looking good. We're gonna open up the evaporator panels right in here and uh, we're gonna check the evaporator super heat. Came up onto the roof, we're just waiting for the evaporator to turn back on, just looking at everything. You know, we're not always gonna achieve this amazing perfection. This works, it's fine, the line's supported. Um, we sealed up the roof penetration because we did have to open it up. We just put a dab of silicone and then put the tech screws down to hold it on nice and sturdy. The line set is a, uh, a soft line set. We, do, we try to do one piece line sets as much as possible. So the only braze joints are up here and down below. And there's actually a braze joint right here too. But there's nothing in the attic as far as braze joints go. That way, when we can, we try to do that. That way it just makes it easier next time when we're trying to find a leak. I'm always try to make it easier for the next guy. So um, my personal opinion is I'm not a huge fan of these units. They're very disorganized. I don't like the, the wiring and stuff, but I mean, they're functional, they work. So we're gonna open up the top and we'll show you. Pulled the side panels off just to investigate. So these units come pre-installed with all their components. They use the Sun, Sun Hua, Sun Yua. I don't know how to pronounce that components and I'll show you the expansion valve um, again I'm not a fan but I mean I guess it's functional uh, I don't really care for the sight glasses either because they're a little bit more difficult to see but um, one thing I want to point out is one of the new things that I'm noticing on a lot of these new condensing units is the extra sub cooling circuit so if you look at discharge line coming right into the condenser comes out of the condenser okay right here goes into the receiver comes out of the receiver, goes back into the condenser, just to verify proper subcooling, then comes out of the condenser down here, goes to the liquid line filter dryer, then to the sight glass, then downstairs. So I've seen that on uh, Russell evaporators or uh, cold zone. I've seen that, on, I mean, I'm sorry, condensers, Russell condensers. So I'm assuming that's part of the new energy standard. Uh, we'll probably see that popping up a lot more. On the, the Russell install that I did, I noticed that uh, you actually had measurable subcooling, which is very rare. I think I had 10 degrees of measurable subcooling. Uh, this unit does have a fan cycle control. Uh, one of the more common failure points I see on these is the fan cycle controls. They use these peanut style, so this is our low pressure. And I believe this is our fan cycle, the yellow. Um, I see a high failure rate on these, but we'll see. Maybe they've changed something. Um, yeah, everything looks fine in here. You know, I really dig this this new Armaflex up here because when you're pulling it through the attic and through the penetrations, it doesn't let it rip, you know, and it's UV resistant, so that's kind of cool. Um, this is just, uh, I think it's like Mueller pre-made line set, you know. I didn't ask for this stuff. This is just what the customer has now. Uh, this is an R448A system. Uh, it did come pre-charged with 5.5 pounds. Uh, that's good for up to a 50-foot line set. Um, don't see anything crazy. Again, not a super fan of this wiring, how it's just in here. But, I mean, it is what it is. Uh, this, I'm going to try to move this away from the condenser. This is too, I mean, from the compressor. This is too close to the compressor. Uh, 220 degrees uh, you got to measure that back here I don't know if they gave me enough room there so I'm definitely gonna move this as far away from there as I can that's that's a little bit better I'd still like to even see it further uh, with 448 a in the summertime they're gonna have some high discharge temps for sure uh, that's a very common thing with 448 a but yeah I don't see anything else scary this is all factory this insulation uh, they did use Copeland compressors so that's a plus uh, they use these peanut style pressure controls. I already talked about those. They do have a time delay in here. There's no defrost clock because the defrost is built into the Ketotherm or the Firefox or whatever it is. I'm Firefox. That's like a Super Nintendo game. <laughs> um, but uh, whatever. The Ketotherm Evap Efficiency or Evap Temp Plus Defrost Controller or whatever. 
Um, okay, so we're gonna go ahead and gauge up on this guy up here and then we'll check those super heat numbers once we come on. One thing I will say, with the two speed evaporator fan motors, it takes a lot longer for the system to come on. So, um, let's see. So we do have a fan cycle control, it just turned on right now. So that's a plus. We're gonna watch the fan cycle control actually work. Of course, I don't have my high side probe on there yet. I'm actually gonna turn it off. That way I can get my high side probe on and we can see the cut in of the, the fan cycle control. Okay, we are probed up. Um, interesting, let's see how good this one does. Normally, we have a receiver, you're not gonna get a very cool subcooling number, very good subcooling number. Um, on the last one of these that I did, with that extra subcooling circuit. I think I had measurable 10 degrees subcooling after the liquid line filter dryer. So we're gonna go ahead and measure right here, which is a ways away. Typically, you know, subcooling, we don't use it on the refrigeration side. We usually just clear the side glass. We're looking for some subcooling. You can use it as a, a metric for gross overcharge. If you have crazy high subcooling, you know, you can expect that you're overcharged or something's going on, but this is interesting. So normally measuring just coming out of the condenser, I typically see three to six degrees subcooling, okay, on a normal system. Now with this one, we're gonna measure here and let's see what we actually measure. Um, we have a liquid line pressure right here. They don't have a true discharge port on here, so I can't measure discharge pressure, which is gonna kinda skew my number for the fan cycle control because all that extra subcooling, um, I imagine there's gonna be a bit of a pressure drop between the high side pressure and the low side pressure. I'm sorry, and the liquid line pressure. Not much, I'd, I'd say three to five PSI would be my guess, but I can't really measure it because I can't see it. Um, so that's an interesting one. But uh, okay, we're ready to go. Discharge line temperature, liquid line temperature, outdoor air temperature, and then we have uh, evap or suction pressure downstairs and suction temperature and then we have superheat, subcooling, all that. So let's turn it on um, and see where the condenser fan motor turns on. Uh, also, I've got my amp clamp here measuring total amperage. So we're about 185, 196. Let's wait for the condenser fan motor to turn on. I would imagine it's gonna turn on about 250, up oh, about 220. But again, I don't know the exact one, but okay, so we're gonna probably see that cycle on and off and it's gonna mess with our system. So let's have a look at that subcooling. Look at that, man. 11 degrees subcooling measured on the outlet after all that stuff. That, that extra subcooling circuit really does work. Uh, 10 degrees superheat on the evaporator. I, that's looking great. Um, let's see what my discharge pressure or discharge line temperature is. Uh, outdoor air temps 57 degrees, 128 degree discharge temp. Okay, yeah, I mean, Box temp is 37 degrees, so we're gonna run for a minute. We're just gonna let it run and stabilize, but I like that superheat. I'm not gonna try to adjust anything with that superheat number like that. Now, this is a 448A system. Um, we're running a 17 degree evaporator coil right now. That's not too bad. Uh, what's our evaporator TD? Should tell us right here. Evaporator TD is 20 degrees right now. Condenser TD is about 23 degrees. That's pretty good for not using a micro channel. Um, pretty cool. Uh, okay, so I'm glad that they didn't just use a stock fan cycle control. They actually put a fan cycle control for R22 or 448A, which is good because normally the 200, 250 would be on, off, on, off, on, off. So they actually did do a decent job. Uh, it looks like we just satisfied. So, wow, that was really quick. Um, but I'm, I'm liking this, this is looking good. So I'm gonna watch it for a little bit longer and when it turns back on, we'll, uh, we'll check the current draw and test the electrical and all that stuff. I have uh, turned off power and verified it's off, so we're good. I'm gonna go ahead and just double tighten on the electrical controls, make sure all the contacts are nice and tight. We're good, we're good, we're good. Don't see any scary wiring. I mean, everything's nice and snug in here. Uh, you know, like I said, I'm not a super fan of these units, but at least it's simple and we don't got a lot of crap. Um, I think I like this ICM cycle control here, or short cycle time delay. It looks pretty nice. Kinda, I like the quality of it a little bit better than the ones that are used on the Heatcraft units. Um, yeah, nothing too crazy, everything's looking good. So like I said, we're gonna watch this thing cycle a few times, make sure everything else is good. Uh, yeah, we wrote startup on it yesterday. I wrote the charge, 448A, 
So everything's looking good. And while we're waiting for it, you know, you want to look to make sure nothing's loose. You want to look for wires that might rub out on discharge lines. Um, don't see anything. Make sure everything's secured as best as possible. Looking okay. I don't see anything scary. I, this is not good. I mean, the way that these wires are run together, but you can only do so much. You know, people comment all the time in my videos about the American standard of wiring, and, and it's true. This, this is kind of silly. They get away with UL approval and different things like that because it's within an enclosed cabinet. Um, it's true that in other parts of the world, you know, everything's ran in conduits and better secured and better connection points. Um, you know, it's just kind of how it is. We just got to deal with what we got. It looks like we're getting ready to turn back on. My box temp is at 37.7 degrees. So I think it'll turn on at the end of 37, right at 38, I think. Five, six, seven, eight, I think. I think I had a three degree differential. So anyways, we'll see. You saw that, how the compressor cycled on for a second. It still isn't calling, but what's happening is, is the pressure's rising in the suction line and it slowly turns it on. Um, but that's why we also have the uh, time delay. So that way you don't do short cycling on the compressor. Uh, sometimes on the, uh, the adjustable pressure controls, you can set the cut in and cut out too low and you can have on, off, on, off, on, off. Heatcraft has a real bad habit of that right now. Um, and those time delays really are helpful to prevent that compressor short cycling. So we're still waiting for this guy to turn on. You can see that two speed evaporator really slows down the on off time because it's uh, 38 degrees in the box and it's been that way for a good five minutes at least, maybe 10 minutes. So our system just turned back on. So we're waiting for the fan cycle control to kick in. Uh, current draw is about three amps right now and rising. So it's going to go up with the condenser fan motor turning on. So it just turned on. We had a peak and then it dropped down. 3.65. Our total load on the unit is about 5.9. So we're under current draw. Let's get a condenser fan motor current draw real quick. Condenser fan motor is running at 0.64 amps. Uh, condenser fan motor, does it have it on here? 0.5. Let's see it again. That's interesting. Let's see what the actual condenser fan motor says we can run. 0.5 amps. Huh. That's interesting. So the condenser fan motor is right, slightly over amping. But there's not a whole lot I can do about that. 0.64 amps. I'm not too worried about it, but we'll make a note of that on startup uh compressor itself um is doing fine let's check the crankcase heater uh we're not getting measurable amperage but it's a very small heater so i might need to wrap it or something um let me grab it it's hot the crankcase heater's hot sometimes on these small ones you got to wrap it around but they didn't give me enough room there to be able to measure it um Okay, side glass is clear. So the only thing I'm a little concerned about on this startup is that condenser fan motor slightly over amping. Uh, that is a, a weird motor. It's kind of warm. The last thing I'm gonna check on it, I mean, there's not a whole lot I can do. This isn't my system here. Uh, I will say that we are running, we should check voltage too to see what voltage we're actually running. I believe it was slightly over 208 volts if I remember correctly. Um, yeah. That's pretty much it. Looks like we just came down and satisfied. All right, this is a three microfarad capacitor. We're running right at three microfarads. I pulled one lead off. I mean, there's nothing else really I could do about that condenser fan motor. It's some weird off brand, just like everything else in this unit. So I didn't sell them this unit. This is what it is. So I'm just gonna report all my stuff down, give it to the customer and they can do what they will with it. I uh, probably put a 9721 Fasco motor on there to replace that silly looking thing. I'm not a fan of all these weird after or off brand components. I like, I'm stubborn and I like my Sporlin components and my Fasco components. And But hey, I guess I'm just a creature of habit. All right, I wanted to prove that the crankcase heater was working and I couldn't leave well enough alone. So first off, I came over here to the electrical section and found the crankcase heater wires, okay? 
um, turned off power, measured the resistance across the crankcase heater. The resistance value that I measured was 1.46 K ohms, okay? Uh, went ahead and put this back on, measured the voltage, 213 volts, okay? Then what I did was uh, I wanted to measure the current draw across the uh, heater, but my meter doesn't go low enough, okay? So what I did was I double wrapped the wires, okay? And let's do this again real quick. So if we just simply double wrap the wire around my clamp head, let me do this with my one hand in here. Okay, so we've wrapped it two times and all of a sudden we get a resistance, or I mean, uh, we can measure current now. But that's not an accurate number. That's 0 0.30 amps, but we need to divide that by two because we measured or we wrapped it twice. So that would be 0.15 amps, okay? So we are actually measuring current, 0.15 amps. If we go over to our Ohm's Law calculator and we input the 213 volts that I measured and we input the resistance value that I measured, 1.46 K ohms, okay? We're given some numbers when we hit calculate. 31 watts is what we're delivering. And this is should be our amp uh, reading and, and it's in milliamps, okay? 145 0.890 milliamps. Divide that by a thousand or move the decimal place all the way over three times. One, two, three. That's 0.145 amps, okay? And we're measuring 0.15. Now there's a little discrepancy there, but that's just the accuracy of the meter. So this crankcase heater is working properly and it's delivering what it's supposed to be delivering. And if we come over here, um, it says the heater watts are 40 watts. And yeah, we're, we're within range. And uh, with that being said, that probably explains why we're slightly higher than what the rated motor amps are on that condenser fan motor because we're not actually delivering 230 volts, we're delivering lower than 230 volts. It is allowed to run 208, 230, but I, I'm interested to know, it's saying 0.5 amps. Um, I bet you that's just because we're below 230 volts. All right. Um, well, we're gonna go downstairs. All right, my box is currently satisfied down in here, but everything looks fine in here, nothing too crazy. Again, they went with some funky, it's a Sun Sunhua valve or something, tiny little thing. Um, I would say they would, my personal opinion is, they'd probably be better off if they were gonna use a stainless steel power head like they did with using a stainless steel capillary tube because this copper one's gonna be susceptible to rub outs. It's not as strong as the stainless steel. Um, and it's not replaceable. You gotta change the whole valve. It's not like a spoiling valve that, you know, if the power head went bad, you could just change the power head. Other than that, I mean, it works. They use an Emerson valve, a uh, solenoid valve. Uh, you know, the wiring in these things is not really impressive, but it's not horrible. Motor's in there, two speed. We're on low speed right now. Uh, you've got your two speed relay up in there. That's fine. Your electrical in here. Everything's looking good so far, so I'm not seeing any issues. So when this thing turns on, we're just gonna start putting everything back together. Uh, the box is working and we're gonna give it to the customer and we're done with it now. I will say the expansion valve's rather loud. You can see uh, it was at zero degrees super heat a minute ago and then when the valve starts adjusting, man, you can hear that. But, all right, well, we're still right within range maintaining right around 10 degrees superheat. So let's see what my box temp, well my box temp right now is about 37 degrees. All right, so that was just a typical startup. You know, um, it's difficult for me to normally show actual equipment installations on video because there's so many moving parts. I have people there, it's just always difficult, okay? This one, it just so happened that I wasn't able to do the, the superheat check and everything the day that we did the startup. So I went ahead and went back and I was there by myself, so I was able to go ahead and film it. Now, um, I always, always, when I start up the equipment, in my situation, the customer is having me typically replace walk-in cooler, walk-in freezer equipment on existing operating equipment okay so i'm doing a retrofit replacement basically so we're under a time crunch when we do that because we have active food inside the box and we have to be careful that the box temperatures don't get too high while we're doing our installation and we have to factor that into our install so with that being said i don't really have time to stop film 
you know, and do that kind of stuff. But on top of that, we're usually under the gun and we have to get the equipment operating as fast as possible so that way we can get it up and running. Oftentimes, I will come back after the fact the next day or two later and do a, a, a basic startup just to make sure that everything is working properly. Now, of course, when I do that, I don't leave the equipment. You know, I make sure that it actually drops in temp. I look at some vital signs and make sure that it's operating before I leave, okay? So in this case, I went ahead and went back, just did my typical startup, just making sure that everything is, you know, running like it should be. I did not even have to adjust the expansion valve. The superheat was right where it should be. Um, didn't really have to change much of anything. I changed a parameter on the temperature controller. I didn't catch it on film, but the defrost strategy was not correct. So I changed the defrost strategy. Um, and then I just proved, I showed you guys how I proved that the actual crankcase heater was working. Um, I like to watch the fan cycle control turn on and off. And one thing as I was editing this video that I realized I should have done was I should have wrote on the equipment panels what uh, the evaporator TD, the condenser TD was, and the fan cycling cut in and cut out was. So the next time I go back through, I'll definitely write that down on the equipment. That way the next tech knows. Now, once you know the standard operating TD, okay, and it's also important to understand something, just because it was designed with a 15 degree TD or a 10 degree TD, whatever the manufacturer designed it with, doesn't necessarily mean it's always going to perform that way. There's different factors that go into play there, depending on how the manufacturer sized the equipment and that kind of stuff, okay? Now, I had nothing to do with the equipment sizing here. So I don't know what kind of a TD, evaporator TD, they spec'd when they designed and sized the evaporator. So I can just go off of the system seems to be running properly. We did have a 20 degree evaporator TD, which is a little bit steep. I don't expect it to usually be that high, usually 10 to 15 degrees, um, but it's operating fine. I didn't see anything wrong. So from that point forward, we can assume that the TD more than likely is going to stay the same. And if you know the evaporator TD, so when I go back and I write it down on the panel, then you can predict what the refrigerant pressures are going to be, okay, based off of the temperatures. So if we know that the evaporator TD was 20 degrees on startup and it maintains that, then the next time I go in there to work on it, we can assume that the evaporator TD will be 20 degrees below the box temperature, okay? Um, and or I'm sorry, the evaporator temperature will be 20 degrees below the box temperature. Therefore, we can predict what our refrigerant pressure should be for the most part. Now, keep in mind, you want to, when you're doing that, you want to make sure that the box is kind of down to temperature because the expansion valve can do all kinds of funky stuff when it's really feeding hard, you know, or uh, trying to bring that coil temperature down. So that's why they say you make superheat adjustments and so forth when the, the unit is almost satisfied and or near, you know, satisfying. Um, so you got to be careful about that kind of stuff. But just writing down that data really helps me out. Um, obviously, I have video logs of all this stuff. So that's a, a benefit that I have, you know, I can go back and look at what was the operating pressures? What was this thing doing? You know, that kind of stuff. Okay. But always double checking your work, making sure, you know, when we're doing those installs, again, I said, we're kind of under a time crunch. So sometimes we skip steps, we forget to clamp things down or what may be it, you know, so you always want to look around. Um, that's pretty much it on this one. Not too much of a crazy video. I really, really appreciate you guys. I want to say thank you so very much to those of you that have chosen to support the channel. And you don't necessarily have to monetarily support the channel. Simply just watching the videos all the way through to this point is a huge support for the channel, okay? Leaving a thumbs up or a thumbs down and leaving a comment, that's huge, okay? But those of you that have gone above and beyond, thank you so very much. We do have a Patreon uh, page where people can become patrons and I have several people on there. Uh, we have YouTube channel memberships. I have several people on there. And then we have people that have chosen to buy merch at my website, hvacrvideos.com. Thank you guys so very much for those of you that have chosen to do that. And thank you so very much for those of you that have done the simplest way to support this channel. And that is to simply watch the videos to this point. Okay. It really, really does help out my channel, helps this to grow. I, I can't say thank you enough. You guys are so awesome, okay? Uh, with that being said, we're going to go ahead and close this one out. Keep in mind that I do live streams Monday evenings, 5 p.m. Pacific on YouTube, work permitting. And I go live with the HVAC Overtime YouTube channel about 6.05 p.m. Pacific time on uh, the HVAC Overtime YouTube channel, okay? Uh, one thing I do want to point out too is we have a lot, a, a large amount of people that are regular watchers of my videos that are not subscribed to the channel. Now, I do realize that there might be some fudge factor in there if people are watching on different browsers and not logged in and things like that, but there's still a 
there's actually a higher percentage of people that are not subscribed to my channel that are watching these. So please consider subscribing to the channel. That helps me out too, okay? Turn the notifications on. I've also been getting a lot of uh, feedback from people saying that they're not getting notifications even though that they're turned on. And, and that's kind of been bothering me. I don't know if YouTube's doing something weird. So uh, if you made it this far, let me know in the comments. Are you guys interested in like, an email list or a Facebook notification list, like some other way to make sure that you guys are getting notified. Also keep in mind that I post consistently, okay? Videos post Sunday morning and Thursday afternoon every single week, okay? Live streams are every Monday. I mean, consistent timing, but still, there's a lot of people that are saying, hey man, I don't get notifications anymore. I didn't know that you went live or different things like that. So I'm trying to figure out a way to notify all you guys. So are you guys interested in any of that? Or I mean, do you just wanna let it be? It'll definitely be extra work for me to have to send out an email, hey, I'm posting a video, but I'd definitely be willing to do it if it'll help people to actually see the video. So leave me a comment down in the YouTube comments and let me know what you think about that. Uh, again, I really, really appreciate you guys and we will catch you on the next one, okay?